We know so little about Scarlatti that until recently we weren't even quite sure what he had looked like. This rediscovered portrait is still the only authentic one we have. He was born the same year as Bach and Handel in 1685. But where their lives are richly documented, the record of his remains meagre and patchy. In an age devoted to musical gossip, he seems to have been mysteriously untalked about. He is personal to us only through his music, and the fame of that rests on a sudden outpouring of genius in the very sunset of his career. Some 550 sonatas for harpsichord unlike anything else in the 18th century. Few of them were published in his lifetime, but these are the manuscript copies belonging to Maria Barbara of Braganza, a Portuguese princess who became Queen of Spain and for whom most of them were written. She was 12 when he became her music master, he was 35 and remained in her service for the rest of his life. The sonatas for Maria Barbara are not only Scarlatti's musical testament, they are the nearest thing we have to his autobiography. In 1684, only months before he was born, his father had arrived in Naples. A Sicilian from Palermo, Alessandro Scarlatti was 25 years old, determined, ambitious, and already famous as a composer of operas. In fact, all his life he was to be much more famous than his son. He had come to take up an appointment as Maestro di Capella to the Viceroy of Spain. Naples at this time was a Spanish dominion, an important if politically precarious outpost of a still wealthy empire. With appropriate grandeur, the viceregal palace mirrored the customary habits of an 18th century court. Music was one of its necessities and generously provided for. Alessandro would be expected to write and to supervise the performance of everything from cantatas and oratorios for the royal chapel to serenades and operas for more secular diversion. As he was immensely industrious and prolific, this was hardly a problem. In the next five years, he composed over 60 works for the court theatre alone. His energies were not confined to composing. He was as ambitious for the whole Scarlatti clan as for himself. And with Alessandro at the helm, sisters, brothers and in-laws all found musical employment at court. The family didn't live in the palace, but in the swarming Santa Maria del Monte quarter of Naples. And here the fifth of Alessandro's ten children was born on the 26th of October, 1685. He was christened in this church, and even at such an early stage of his career, his father was making provision for his future. The godmother who held him at the font was the viceroy's wife and he was named Domenico after the owner of the Palazzo Madaloni, another influential patron. The child everyone called Mimo was brought up to a rich heritage of Neapolitan noise. He was surrounded by a family which lived and breathed opera. The city conservatoires were forcing grounds for teenage instrumentalists and choristers. From the streets came the older music of the people, the strum of guitars and the stamp of the tarantella, and sustaining all the ritual ceremonies of the church. This is the tiled cloister of the convent of Santa Chiara. But where are we now? back on the stage of a theatre, or in the opera house, or in the streets of Naples itself, among scenes and characters familiar to Mimo as a boy. In fact, we are still in Santa Chiara, for this is a Neapolitan Christmas crib of the 18th century, and the music is Alessandro's, a Siciliana from one of his Christmas cantatas.
a century later, at his harpsichord in faraway Spain, Domenico would remember the Christmases of childhood, with the stamp of peasants dancing and the drone of shepherds' bagpipes behind a lilting Neapolitan carol. One inlaid altarpiece is all that's now recognisable of the Viceroy's Chapel in Naples as Domenico once knew it. On September the 13th, 1701, he was appointed the organist here. It was his first professional employment and he was not quite 16. Though he must also have composed for the chapel, none of that music survives. But there does survive some of what he wrote in the field for which his father was most famous, operas for the court theatre. He composed three of them over the next three years, and characteristically his aunts, his uncles, in-laws, and possibly a younger brother were all involved in the productions. They sang, they played, they scene-painted, and even provided an impresario for his settings of the usual convoluted plots from classical mythology. He sent Domenico in his 20th year to Italy's most music-conscious city. As he wrote in a famous letter, I have detached him by force from Naples, where although there is room for his talent, his talent is not for such a place. This son of mine is an eagle whose wings are grown. He must not remain idle in the nest. I must not hinder his flight. At Venice's convent of the Pietà, the young eagle was set to study with the choir master there, the celebrated composer and an old friend of Alessandro's, Francisco Gasparini. He would learn harmony and counterpoint from a master of the old school. 
he would profit from a renowned teacher of the harpsichord. And every Sunday at the Pietà, he would hear its famous orchestra of nuns and novices premiere the concertos of Vivaldi. It was Domenico's Venetian training which allowed him later to become so bold an innovator. His firm grounding in tradition gave him his base for experiment. To produce those new and bold effects, as they've been called, which were the delight and wonder of every hearer. He broke all the rules of convention to let in the impressions of life around him.
On points, Domenico was narrowly judged the winner at the harpsichord, but on the organ, he himself conceded the honours to his friend. Whenever his own execution was admired, it said he would mention Handel and cross himself in veneration. And the admiration was evidently mutual, in spite of a contrast of temperaments which was to lead them in very different directions. We're told Handel's playing was brilliant in its fullness and energy, Scarlatti's brilliant in delicacy and expression. Scarlatti often wrote sonatas in pairs, contrasted like the characters of these two friends. Domenico was often spoken of by Handel with great satisfaction, for besides his talents as an artist, he had the sweetest temper and the gentlest behaviour.